Hello and welcome to today's class called the Transfer of Title. Now, before we get started, I want to give you some basic concepts. Title is an etherical concept, all right? It's something that you cannot see or touch. Think of it like an idea. I cannot really show you the idea. I can show you the wheel that came from my idea, but I can't really show you the idea, all right? So title is like that. It's an etherical concept. I can show you the title insurance policy that comes from title, but I can't really see title. So don't confuse it with like the title of a car, all right? It's same word, different concepts, all right? It's the same word, but it means two different things. In the real estate world, it means two things. It means I have the rights. Remember the rights we talked about? So title means I have the rights and I have the right to convey them to another person. All right. So it's a completely different concept than the title of a car, for instance, which you can see. Here we cannot see it. Okay, and in this conveyance, we are going to t today talk about the transfer boop, of the title from one person to another. I always tell people it's kind of like if you remember that game Zelda, remember the little character that had the diamond on her head and she'd bump into someone else and that diamond would switch. Boop, boom. That's what we're going to talk about today, the conveyance of title. So let's get started. So title is the right to and the evidence of ownership of a land. And I have the right and the evidence to transfer boop, that title. And if you remember back, we talked about the old English days where they would break a branch off and pass it from one person to another as a symbolic showing of the conveyance. And I told you at that point, we do that today only now we use this legal document called a deed. A deed is that conveyance particle boop, that goes from one person to the other. Now, remember that we talked about those two types of the OR and the E -E. Now, in the legal world or in the real estate world, we use these two terms, the grantor and the grantee, because remember, you can give real estate away. So technically, you can't legally use the word seller and buyer because there could be a gift. But in our world, since we deal in the sale of the conveyance, we will most often use these words, the seller and the buyer. But please understand, those are just one examples. And in the title or the deed, it actually uses the words grantor and grantee because it may not always be a sale. And the mechanism for doing this is what we call a deed and a deed is the document that transfers the title from the grantor to the grantee all right we do that in two ways the first way we're going to talk about is what's called voluntary alienation now alienation means to separate yourself from so voluntarily means we are going to choose to do this through a uh, deed. And the owner intentionally conveys the ownership from one person to another through a deed, either a gift or a sale. Hence the words grantor and the grantee. That's the two words that we're going to be using today. So understand that. Now, a deed is a legal document, 
and must fulfill all of the requirements of the document. So let's go through all of the things that would be on a deed. The first is to make sure that the grantor, all right, the grantor has the legal capacity to engage in a contract. So they must be of sufficient mental capacity to understand what they're doing and they must be of legal age. Almost all states in the United States require that the person be 18 years of age to convey real estate. So the grantor is the person who is either giving it away or selling it. Now, the other thing on the title is going to be the grantee has to be named and identified and they have to be identified in such a manner that they can legally and sufficiently be sure that's who you're talking about. So in other words, <clears throat> I cannot deed my property to my best buddy, Bill. Who's my best buddy, Bill? Nobody knows. I can't deed my property to my BFF. I cannot deed the property to my favorite cuz. All right, I have to name them. I deed the property to Bill S. Minor III. And that way it is very sufficient as to who I'm talking about. Now, that grantee also has to have legal capacity, meaning he must be, or she, or they, <clears throat> sufficient mental capacity and at least 18 years of age. Now, there is a statement of consideration. So let's talk a little bit. I know we haven't touched on contracts, but let's go over and talk about. Contracts have to have several items that make them valid. The most common one that people talk about is this thing called consideration. Consideration is something of value that is by both parties that can be exchanged for the real estate. Now, it's funny that we talk about the marriage contract. The marriage contract, when a couple gets married, you will often hear your pastor or the justice of the peace or whoever you use talk about marriage as a contract. Well, technically, it legally is. It actually fulfills all of the requirements for a contract. Now, I'm going to ask you to trust me on that right now because we haven't got to contract yet. But trust me, it does. And in a marriage contract, consideration, the thing of value is that love, honor, and cherish each other. That is what has value between a husband and a wife. Unfortunately, in the real estate world, the consideration cannot be counted as love, honor, and cherish. So here's another term. In real estate, we deal with what's called an arm's length transaction. An arm's length transaction is somebody who you do not know. They are at arm's length from you. All right. So the buyer and the seller typically don't know each other. Now, I'm not saying that they can't, but in a true real estate deal, an arm's length transaction are between buyers and sellers or parties that really have no relationship. And because that is true, the love, honor, and cherish cannot count as consideration. So what do we use? What's the most common form of consideration? Well, I hope you've guessed this. Money. Money is typically the arm's length consideration. 
I don't know the buyer. The buyer doesn't know me, but we both understand money. We both trust it as a valuable commodity that can be traded between the parties. All right. Now, it is actually so important in this contract that in a deed, there is a generic term that says something to the effect of for $10 and other valuable consideration. That deed or that term is actually in the deed. That way, when we, should we, if we give it away, there still is some nominal value to this. And that nominal value of $10 actually fulfills the requirement for a contract, which would make this deed legal. All right. So in this consideration, not sure what happened. In this consideration section, we actually have a statement that says for $10 and other good and valuable services. That is to make the deed a legal contract and have all of its parts. There is a clause inside of the deed called the transfer, the granting clause, all right? The granting clause is the clause that actually conveys the property, that actually conveys it from one party to the other. Now, what I want to do is start over here and go through the fact that there are actually five granting clauses, okay? So if you will jump over to the warranties, this page here. So we were here talking about the granting clause, B, and I want you to talk to, let's go to type D, D types of deeds, because it's very important you understand that there are four types of deeds that we can convey and it is verbiage specific, meaning whatever the deed says defines the type of deed they are conveying. So the first one I want to talk about is what is called the general warranty deed. All right. The general warranty deed. Now, the general warranty deed is the big mama Luca. It's the one that everybody wants to use. It is the highest protection to the buyer that there can be. All right. And in the general warranty deed, there are going to be five covenants, five promises, however you want to look at it five guarantees that the seller is making to the buyer. All right. There are five of them. The first one is called the covenant of session. The covenant of session is how it's pronounced. Now I will tell you the tests love this word because most people forget what it means. The covenant of session says, Hey, dude, I own the property. I have the full ownership and the legal rights. I am guaranteeing you that. That's the first promise the seller is making, the covenant of session. I have the property, I own the rights, and I have the ability to transfer them. The second thing that the general warranty deed is guaranteeing is called the covenant against encumbrances, meaning that the title that I'm passing you 
is free from all of those encumbrances that we have mentioned in a previous chapter. Now remember, easements, encroachments, uh, liens, all of those are the, these encumbrances that we're talking about. And if you remember when we talked about those, we talked about this term about uh, <clears throat> that those are going to be removed, meaning I'm going to pay my mortgage off. I'm going to bring the real estate taxes current. Those are all the encumbrances that I will remove. That when I pass this property to you, boop, it will be free from all the liens in, and encumbrances. Now, here's a little spoiler alert. There is a section that I cannot remove. And if you remember easements, we talked about an easement running with the land. Those I cannot remove. So like back to that drawing, if you remember where B and A shared the same driveway, I cannot remove that easement because B needs access to the property, even though A is going to be a new owner. And we use the term survives the closing or runs with the land because some encumbrances cannot be removed. And we'll talk about those here in just a second. <clears throat> so the third one, and I'm going to move it down to here because it doesn't really matter, but it just makes more logical sense to me, is the covenant of quiet enjoyment. Now, remember, that should sound familiar to you because that's one of the actual five twigs we talked about way back in chapter one or two, the covenant of, of quiet enjoyment. This is where there is no third party person coming to take the property unjustly. And the grantor is telling the new grantee, hey, there's nobody out there that is coming to try and take this property. That's the third one. Now, the fourth one is kind of ironic. Or this one, it doesn't matter. Once again, the order is not doesn't matter with them being numbered. The fourth one is called the covenant of further insurance, which says, hey, I promised you that there was nobody out there. I gave you the covenant of quiet enjoyment. However, what happens if I didn't know? I can't protect you against things I didn't know. That's what this one says. If I'm wrong about the quiet enjoyment, I promise that I will help you under the covenant of further assurance to try and solve that issue. That is the covenant of further assurance. And then the last one that the grantor is promising is that I am making these promises or these covenants forever. All right, forever. So look at what the seller i.e. the grantor, is telling the buyer, i.e. the grantee, I own the property. I have the right to transfer it. I'm going to remove all of the encumbrances. There's nobody out there coming to take it unjustly. If I was wrong about that, I actually promised to help you. And I promised to do this forever. Those are the five requirements or the five covenants inside of the general warranty deed. And that would be listed right here in the granting clause where it says, I, Raymond Modulin, convey and warrant would be the terms used to express a general warranty deed. I, Raymond Modulin, convey and warrant. 